Well, hello and welcome to the Monday edition of DC Today. Back here in the New York office. What a freezing cold weekend for this Southern California kid, but nevertheless a lovely weekend in the world's greatest city. And um, uh, some fun things to talk about here today. If I feel like, if it feels to you like I'm going very quickly, it's because I am going very quickly. I am running late for an appointment, but I did not want to miss the podcast and video for you all. Just quickly, I shall say that the market uh, was up big on, on Friday and then futures opened up last night, fi up 50 points. The market uh, opened up about 100 points this morning and got higher than that. At one point it gave some of that back and then kind of bounced around. It did end up closing up 138 points on the day. So 36 basis points as a percentage higher on the Dow, 22 higher on the S&P, 32 higher on the NASDAQ. So about a third of a point, give or take, um, on, on the market indices. The S&P and Dow are at all time highs, but the Russell 2000, the small cap index, is still down 20% from its 2021 high. That is just weird. Not just that it's still down, not every index is gonna all make an all time high at the same time, but I have to say that uh, it is quite strange to actually have the Russell 2000 technically in bear market territory. Similarly odd, the best performing country stock markets so far this year, we're only a few weeks in the new year, is Japan. It's up over 9%. That's up after a 28% upside last year. The worst performing year to date is Hong Kong. So um, even though you could think of them in a similar region, obviously very different economic circumstances and different drivers of the stock market performance creating this disparity year to date. Bond market was up today. The 10 year came down to 4.1, down four basis points. Best performing sector on the day was industrials, up three quarters of a percent. Consumer discretionary was the worst performer, down half of a percent. A couple interesting tidbits. Financials are projected to be 18% of the S&P's earnings this year, but they are less than 13%, about 12.8% of the S&P weighting of the actual market cap of the S&P. Inversely, the Magnificent Seven are projected to be 21% of the earnings of the S&P, which is a monumental number. Seven companies representing a fifth of the earnings earn of the total earnings, and yet they are right now 28% of the current S&P weighting. 21% of earnings, 28% of the weighting within the Magnificent Seven. All right, top news story I got, I think by now it's been 24 hours, everyone's heard the news of Governor DeSantis backing out of the presidential race. Uh, former President Donald Trump is clearly gonna go on to New Hampshire and win the primary there. And, and that, that uh, primary drama on the Republican side um, appears to be headed to an uncontested path very closely. The biggest news to me right now, public policy, I am mystified. I had a breakfast meeting this morning with one of the top political commentators and, and pundits in our country for 30 years. And I was asking him, because he, he is as mystified as I am, why this story is not getting more media coverage. But essentially, um, it is going to pass out of the House Ways and Means Committee with good, strong, bipartisan support. And then in the overall Senate, not just the Senate Finance Committee, the overall Senate, it's going to pass by a wide margin of this child tax credit redo. It's going to, that is essentially about $8 billion of personal tax savings. It's not very large. And then what will amount to about $200 billion of corporate tax savings in 2024 and 2025. And that comes through the things I've talked about before, expense, uh, instant expensing on CapEx, R&D expensing, um, and uh, uh, more or less is being paid for by getting rid of that silly employee retention tax credit. So I don't know why it's not getting more coverage, but a very large supply side benefit coming in tax reform, likely by the end of the month, could go into early February. Economic front, the Suez Canal traffic is down 50% with this drama going on out there. So think container ships, tankers, bulk carriers. We have not seen a big move yet in shipping cost up upwards because of it, but it would seem to me that uh, supply chain disruptions represent a good way to get prices higher. Um, a wonderful chart in our housing and mortgage section today. 
about the median age of a first time home buyer being 29 years old in 1980 when I was in first grade. It's 35 now. So six years later for the average age of one making a first time home purchase. But then the average age of all other buyers besides a first time home buyer. So it could be a second home and it could be an eighth home. It used to be 35 years of age and now it is, um, excuse me, used to be 36 and it is now 58. So speaks to a couple demographic and cultural things there. Odds of a March rate cut are now from 80% down to just a little bit below 50%. But then the odds of the May rate cut, May 1st, so it's only five weeks later after the May 20th meeting, are at 100% and they're reflecting a 50 to 75 basis point rate cut. So the futures market is basically saying you're going to get the same amount of rate reduction, but you're going to get it all in May instead of some in March, some in May. Take it for what it's worth. Oil closing today up over 2%, back up above $75. And please read DC Today for a little extra touch on against doomsdayism and an Ask David question that I thought was very useful. I will leave podcast and video participants to go to thedctoday.com because of time constraints. Thank you as always for listening, watching, and reading the DC Today, and I will see you from New York City here tomorrow. Take care. Mm-hmm.